as you are. say this mountain can't be moved. They say these chains will never break. But they don't know you like we do. There is power in your name. We've heard that there is no
you are this morning, God. We sing how great you are this morning, God. Amidst all of our troubles, amidst all of our trials, amidst all of this COVID up and down and confusion that we're going through, God, we sing how great, how great is our God because you have never changed. You are the same today, yesterday, forever and ever and ever. And we take hold of that and we take faith in that, Father God, and we praise you for your faithfulness. We praise you for your awesomeness. And we just thank you, God, you've brought us through another year. And God, I pray this morning, God, that you would be here. The Holy Spirit would dwell amongst us. We would hear from your word, Lord, and we would leave changed. To give you all the praise and all the glory this morning, Father, for you are worthy of it all. We honor and adore you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we have already worshipped in our singing at Willowdale PC, we also worship through our giving. And we want to give you an opportunity to keep giving to the cause of God. Online giving is available, and it's really easier than ever to do. Just go to our website, willowdalepc.com, and click on the Giving tab in the right-hand side. And under Push Pay, click Give Here, and you can give any amount. Just follow the simple instructions to give. It'll take you less than two minutes, and it's a very secure way to make your donation. For those who don't have access to the internet, please share with them that they can drop off their tithes and offerings here at the church in the office mail slot by the front door. God bless you, and thank you for your faithful giving. Christmas and Happy New Year, Willowdale PC. I'm Maxine, here to bring you your announcements. We've had such a blast with our Treehouse Adventure Kids, and we are so excited to announce that we're gonna resume this season with more games, more Bible stories, and just a lot more fun this February 2nd. So please mark it in your calendars, February 2nd. We've experienced a tremendous amount of growth the past couple of months here at Willowdale PC. And if you want to just learn more about what we do here and how we operate, please visit Membership 101. The first meeting will be January 16th after the second service. Prayer is a huge part of what we do here at Willowdale PC. So come January 7th, we'll be starting back up our weekly Friday prayers on Zoom. For more information, visit our information desk. Young adults, we have a super fun event for you guys to attend January 15th at 7 p.m. Bring $5, and for more information, please talk to Carrie Ann. January 23rd, you really don't want to miss it. Mark it down on every single calendar that you have that we have a special guest speaker. So join us at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. See you there. Well, that's all the announcements I have for you guys today. I really hope you paid attention to the announcements and wrote down all the important dates. 2022 is going to be an amazing year and we have so many fun events. So let's lean in and dive into God's Word today. Praise God. Welcome to Willowdale PC this morning. My name is Peter Kippenuck. I'm associate pastor here. If you don't know that, now you do. Uh, our lead pastors, we're scheduled to be back today, Pastor Blake and Christine, and uh, they had a little bit of complication at the border, no big deal. Uh, they managed to get through it, but they weren't able to be here this morning, but they're excited to see you guys and excited to be with you when they can. So just keep them in your prayers. Uh, pray that they've had a great restful time this last month that they've been off, and uh, we're just going to look into God's Word this morning. Amen. Are you ready? Amen. Um, my sermon this morning is entitled Relative Value. Uh, Oscar Wilde once said, A cynic is a man who knows the price of everything but the value of nothing. So a person who believes that people are motivated purely by a self-interest, a cynic is a man who knows the price of everything but the value of nothing. Cost and value are two very different things, and we all know this very well. When you go shopping for anything, we understand that we are going uh, to have to pay a cost, but we're looking for the best value possible, and everybody loves to get a good deal, am I right? I remember years ago, I was at this, actually, I was trying to do the math in my head last night of how long ago, it was almost 20 years ago now that I was at this flea market, but it was this massive flea market, 
And I would go with my, my parents once in a while, or my brothers, and we all kind of liked to go and just see the things you could find. And at this time, like I said, it was 20 years ago, I was looking for a new phone, and it was the, new, the newest version of <laughs> the wireless phones, not a cell phone. That's how old I am. And uh, I literally showed my daughter one time a pay phone in, in the foyer of a Swiss LA, and, and she said, Daddy, what's that? She had no idea, and why would she, right? I was actually shopping for a phone. So I went to this vendor, and he had the phone. I had, I, I'm a bit of a researcher, and this is the phone I actually wanted. And uh, he had it there, and I went up, and I talked to him, and he told me that he could give it to me for like half the cost of what I thought it should have been worth. So I'm like, well, okay, what's the deal with this? So I said, okay, well, I'll think about it, and I'll come back. And so I went around and looked at all the flea market stuff, and, and you know, like you would on a day, and we're – we're doing this, and my dad's trying to, me to convince me to buy this, and this one's trying to convince me to buy that. And then I came across a table with the exact same phone on the opposite end of the free market. And I'm like, oh, what's the chances? So I'll go up to this guy, and I, I told him, I said, man, I just saw the same phone on the other side. And he's like, oh, yeah, don't buy from that guy. He's a shyster. He'll, he'll take you for everything you have. He says, I'll give you a better price. He says, what did he offer you? So I told him, and then he offered me not much less, but a little bit less. So by now, I, I'm, I'm just curious. i got to see what's going on. So I, go, I hoof it all the way back. And I'm telling you, it was a big flea market. It was a long walk. All the way back up to the other side. And the guys, all of a sudden, he's like, the same thing. Oh, that guy, he's just trying to rip you off. Don't listen to him. I'll give you a better price. And so then he gives me a little bit better price than the other guy. By this time, I'm kind of in my mind. I'm thinking, I'm not buying from either one of these guys. This is too shady. This is kind of how I'm feeling. Uh... And so I, but my curiosity had been piqued so much, I had to figure out what was going on. So I started asking some questions around. And this guy was like, oh, you know what? Those guys are like, they work together. They're brothers or something. And they just set up on either side and said they were trying to play you. I was like, man, I knew there was something. I knew there was something going on. And is there anyone in this world that we have such difficulty determining the value of things? It's any wonder that we're, we have so much trouble trying to figure out what something's worth. We probably miss out on so many things and so many opportunities because we are questioning value and we're wondering, um, you know, how much things cost and, and how do we determine value for this thing. And in the day and age with the Internet and trying to find there's so many options to buy different things. You can go to Wish, to Alley, to to Amazon and, and all these different ones. And some deals look too good to be true. And let me tell you, some deals are too good to be true. If the cost of everything just matched the value, um, it was written, and it was written directly on the thing, then uh, we'd be spared a lot of headaches at times. There's a, I came across this article in, in the New York Post, and it was dated from the 1975. And I started reading it and uh, got very interested in it. And it was actually about something that happened in 1958. And so in 1958, there was an old leather-bound Bible discovered in an attic in a parish that was believed to be a copy of the famed Gutenberg Bible. Now, Johann Gutenberg was the inventor of movable type. And the volume found was discovered by a former minister of a congregation in Imhusen, if I pronounce that correctly, I'm not sure, Imhusen, Germany, and his name is Gerard Uberther. Again, I may have not pronounced that correctly. Forgive me if you're German and you're here, <laughs> or you're hearing that somewhere. When he was moving out of the 100-year-old parish, the house across um, Immenhosen's main street uh, from the stone church that, that he was currently leaving, he left this Bible, this Gutenberg Bible, in the church's library. It was not confirmed as an actual Gutenberg until 17 years later in 1975, and this is when the article was written. It was Frederick Karl Bass, a 37-year-old high school principal who rediscovered it in the library and never stopped believing it could be a Gutenberg Bible. The volume was intact for the most part. It had 317 of the possible 324 pages. The Bible was later appraised, and you'll never guess. It was appraised at $4,000 per leaf, per page. And that was a conservative estimate. And so, and in case you wanted to do the math, 4,000 times 317 is 1,268,000. 
dollars for a dusty leather bound Bible that was found in an attic. Now, I'm not suggesting you go home and crawl around in your attic if you want to. That's fine. That's up to you. But you may not find a Gutenberg Bible, but you may find something that will land you on the Antique Roadshow if you're old enough to remember that thing. The important thing to understand is that value is not always as obvious as we think it is. Uh, so let's define a few terms. Very simply, cost is just the price, right? It's what we pay to acquire. It's the sacrifice sometimes. Our cost is a sacrifice we put in. Uh, sometimes cost is represented in loss, and sometimes cost is represented as a penalty, but ultimately it's the price we pay to acquire something. Value is more understood as relative worth, you know, or, or something's merit or its importance. For instance, a life jacket has great value on someone in a small boat in the middle of the ocean, but has very little value on the back of somebody who's riding a camel in the desert. Not a lot of value there. There are some things in life that have unlimited value, which is not determined by location, situation, or circumstances. I have sentimental things. I'm sure you have sentimental things that if you lost them, you would be heartbroken. And one of those things that I have is this thing right here. And you guys are probably thinking, what on earth is that? This is a squid jigger. And you're like, why is that so important? Well, for me... One thing, it represents my heritage, where I grew up in Newfoundland. Now, consequently, I have actually never squid jigged in my life. Um, but I have put on a pair of chest waders and went down in the beach and literally picked them up out of the water and filled up buckets of them and brought them up to my house and we cleaned <laughs> and caught them that way because sometimes uh, they come into the bays and get caught in the tide. But uh, that's a whole different story. But if you look at this, it actually kind of looks like a little squid, and the squid comes in and he grabs it and he gets caught, and a lot of times they'll have rigs with hundreds of these hooks hooked up, and they'll be pulling them in, they'll be flying over the, flying over the, um, the side of the boat, and they squirt ink, and ink is going everywhere, and, and Newfoundlanders have even written songs about this. But this, you say, well, why would this dry piece of wood with these hooks be important to me? Well, it was a gift from my Uncle Wilson. And my Uncle Wilson just passed away in December. And uh, it was very meaningful to me, this dry piece of wood. There's probably not $10 worth of stuff here. Well, maybe with the amount of filament and the actual hooks. I'm not sure how much they're worth. But to me, this is priceless. To me, this has no cost. You can't offer me enough money to get this out of my hands. You know, we have sentimental things that we hold on to that are just not for sale. They have great value. There is a couple of very short little parables in Matthew 13, verses 40 to 46, that can really illustrate the difference between cost and value. They talk about the immeasur immeasurable value of the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 13, I'd like to read it for you this morning. It says, beginning at verse 44, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought the entire field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away, sold everything he had, and he bought it. Father, I just pray that you would open this very simple word, these very simple parables to our heart today and challenge us with them. Holy Spirit, be the primary communicator in this room, Lord Jesus. I'm just a vessel hoping to be used by you today, Lord Jesus. So speak to our hearts through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what can we learn about the cost and value from these little parables? Well, let's just take a look at the characters here. We have the man who found a treasure is the first guy. Uh, the first character is a man who happened on this treasure that was hidden in the field or buried in the field or, or we're not sure how exactly it was concealed. We love it when that happens, don't we? When you just find something. Have you ever went to put on a coat and you put your hands in the pockets and all of a sudden you pull out a $20 bill? I don't know about you, but that excites me. <laughs> I don't know why I get so excited when you find lost change or lost money in pockets. You're like, oh, look at that. And then your kids come up and say, can I have it? And you say no. 
I remember one day, you know, treasures can look a lot of different ways. I remember one day when I was in the forest in the Newfoundland, we just called it the woods. You know, we were in there, and I might have been in there hunting or doing whatever, but I saw the edge of this blue bag sticking up out of the moss in the ground, and I went over and I started to pull on it. And it was an old Adidas bag. You remember the old Adidas bags with the round in on them with the piping? So it was blue with this white piping. And I opened it up, and there was like four or five cans of Orange Crush in there. And when I picked it up, the, the, steer, the, the tin was so thick, I couldn't, I couldn't dent it with my hand. It was so old. And I brought it home. Because to me, at that time, I was, I was only about 13 or 14 or something, but it was like a treasure. This was like from the early 80s or late 70s or whatever. But I remember getting cans of pop like this when I was a little, little kid. You know the one that you push the thing in that every time you try to do it, you were like, I hope I don't cut my finger this time? You push the big one in and you push the little one in. If you're not old enough to do this, you can look it up online. But at the time, I, fa- I thought, man, this is so cool. And I thought it was treasure. I bring it home. My mom and dad were like, oh, yeah, that's kind of cool. Get it out of my house. And I'm like, I dare you to drink it. So we cracked it open, and it was still carbonated inside. It had to be like 15 years old. And so, you know, I got two brothers. We were like, I dare you to drink it. I dare you to drink it. I, don't, I can't remember if anybody did. I know I didn't. But what this man found was worth quite a bit more than my finding, to say the least. This treasure was so valuable that he hid it again and went and bought the whole plot, the whole field. Not only that, but he sold everything, every single thing he had to achieve this goal. Now, under rabbinic law back in those days, if a workman came upon a treasure in a field and he digs it out of, uh, digs it up, it would be the property of the master, whoever owned the land. He'd have to bring it and give it to the guy, but here uh, the man is careful not to do that, and he takes no chances and sells everything he owns to buy the whole plot of land. And it's, at first thought, it sounds a bit shady, but this is not the point of the whole parable. The point of the parable is the value of the treasure, and that is the main focus. I mean, there's other times in Scripture where, where Jesus teaches lessons, and it doesn't focus on the actual Uh, morality of of what he's teaching, but it focuses on a single point, like when the day of the Lord is coming, like a thief in the night. We don't think that Jesus is going to come to steal anything, but it's describing how he's going to come. It's not about morality. It's not about um, legality. It's about the fact that he's coming and you need to be ready. The value of the treasure is the main focus here. To him, whatever it was he found was worth everything to him. The cost he paid was a bargain as far as he was concerned. Then we have the merchant who was actually searching for something. The difference between the merchant and the other man is that he was actually out looking for something. He was doing his best Indiana Jones impersonation, you know, looking for his holy grail. He was looking for a pearl of great value, and I'm sure there are many of you that have stories of finding your great pearl. And I, I like to poke around Kijiji all the time trying to find sales and deals and stuff. And, and I've used it actually as a supplementary income with things that I've come to know a lot about. Uh, over the years, I've, I've studied and learned a lot about guitars. So when I see one of, uh, that's being sold very cheap, a lot of times I'll buy it and I'll refurbish it and fix it up and I'll resell it. And the same thing with other things. And uh, sometimes you find great value. I remember the first time something like this ever happened. I was at a rummage sale, and you're thinking, all this guy does is go to rummage sales and flea markets. Found a golf club for $5. But I knew enough about the golf club to knew that, know that the shaft that was in the golf club alone was worth 75 So I bought it, but of course the value doesn't translate. So I was able to sell that for $25. I bought another golf club one time for $25. I traded it with a guy on Kijiji for a club of equal value, and then, well, I actually told this guy, I said, you realize that I'm trading you this. I said, I only spent $25 on this. I'm trading you this, and you realize that your club you're trading to me now. I said, I'm going to put it back up on Kijiji for 130 bucks, right? You know that, right? He said, yeah, I'm fine. This is the club I want. Put it back up, and I sold it for $125. Made $100 that day. And people will say, well, that's shady. No, that's, that's, to me, being prudent. It's, it's paying attention and find looking for your pearl. If you know what pearl you want and you find it and you buy it and you appreciate the value, you get it. 
then you get the reward from that. And I don't know if you've ever had experiences like that, but I, I love finding that, that great deal. And like I said, I've used it at times to supplement my income. If you're listening today and you've heard this and you feel ripped off because I bought something cheap and sold it, forgive me. No, I'm just kidding. I actually, my wife gets, is laughs at me because I often tell the people what it's worth when I'm selling it to them. I said, this is what I pay for it, but this is what I'm selling for it. And, and people still pay the money. It's, it's pretty, pretty strange, actually. We do not know how long this man was searching. Something that's not really told. He could have been searching his whole life, or he could have been a young merchant who just started for the first time. But he finally found what he was looking for. Much like the previous man who happened upon the treasure, he saw its value as limitless and was willing to sell everything he had to be able to afford this pearl, which was the X that marked the spot for him. The man and the merchant represent two people who found what they were looking for. As mentioned earlier, these parables are not are about the immeasurable value of the kingdom of heaven, but the treasure and the pearl in these parables are meant to represent the kingdom of heaven, and the price they paid represents the cost of their discipleship. People find their way to God in very different ways, at very different times, um, and on very different timetables, and in very different seasons. Some of you may have been seeking fulfillment in your life for a long time, and some of you may have been aware or unaware that there was such fulfillment available to you. Some of you may have been led here today on your search for meaning. Some of you may have ended up here or are hearing this message online today by what seems like an accident. Maybe you were scrolling through YouTube and found us today and just started listening. The common ground that we all stand on is that no matter what the path we take, When we arrive at the cross, the value of what we find is immeasurable. There are two paths represented in this parable, the unassuming recipient and the ardent searcher. This is today, it doesn't matter if you have been searching for fulfillment your entire life or if it it seems like you were or are in the right place at the right time. The important thing is that when you are confronted with the life-changing gospel of Christ, the kingdom of heaven, you will recognize its worth. Will we recognize that there is no cost too great to acquire an eternal relationship with Jesus Christ? Will we respond to the prompting of the Holy Spirit who is drawing us to the relationship with the one who created us? The cost can be great, I'm talking about the possible sacrifice of relationships, vocation, comfort, wealth, location, just a bit everything in the world that we value. You know, there's a possibility that we may be asked to give it up at some point. Not everyone will understand the value of what you have discovered. They will only see the cost and it will seem too great for them to understand. That is why our lives need to be need to put the value of our relationship with God on display. Consider Paul for a minute. Paul said in Philippians 3, verse 8, he says, What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider it all rubbish. I consider it all garbage that I may gain Christ. We need to realize Paul was surrounded by pearls. Paul was in, as far as the status in his society was concerned, was in a high position. He, had, he was surrounded by pearls of great value. He was a Pharisee. He had a very strong Jewish heritage. He was a Roman citizen. But when confronted with the pearl of greatest value on the road to Damascus, Paul considered the rest of the pearls in his possession Rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. Both men in this parable represent people who recognize the value of eternity with Christ and are willing to consider everything else that they possess as expendable in comparison. If any of those things became an obstacle between them and the kingdom of heaven, they would sell it, leave it, quit it, stop it, move away from it, Cut it out, whatever it took. 
Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is less about a place and more about a person. The kingdom of heaven is about the presence of Jesus. And sometimes we focus so much on the place and we like to dream about heaven, and I do it too. We, we sing the songs about the streets paved with gold, about, I mean, I've been reading stuff re- in recent years about how it talks about how the gates of heaven are going to be open. And I begin to wonder, are we going to be able to come and go and do this and do that? And I wonder what it's going to be like, and I dream about it. I dream what it's going to be like to be in the physical presence of Jesus for the rest of eternity. It's amazing to dream about. And some people muse even about hell. And they think about it. And they get so caught up in, in all the different things and all the different descriptors about what, what hell talks about. But the kingdom of heaven is about presence. And hell is about the absence of that presence. And that is the main thing we need to understand today. It was the presence of Jesus that caused Paul to leave the pearls he once valued and cling to the one he happened upon on the road to Damascus. I look at Paul. Paul's a great example because I feel like he's the guy who's searching for the great pearl but was searching in the wrong direction. He was a Pharisee and he was, and he was doing all this stuff in the name of God because he thought these Christians of the way were, were messing with what you know the Torah and what, what the, the, the scriptures, the old scriptures were talking about. And he was searching, he was searching, but he was searching in the wrong way. But then he was on the road to Damascus, and he, and he happened upon this experience. And Jesus showed up and met him on the road to Damascus. And everything that he valued before that point became less valuable because he met the one pearl of great value. What was the treasure and the pearl worth? It was worth all they had. What is my relationship with Christ worth to me? Something I need to ask myself every day. What is my relationship with Christ worth to me? Does my life and sacrifice display my value for it? When I talk to people about Jesus, do they understand that it is the greatest pearl? Do they understand that it is my greatest treasure and that I would sell and give everything to communicate it, to put it on display, to show them? Did he understand when they talk to me that I value Jesus above everything? Maybe you're here today, you're listening online because you were invited by a friend or whatever reason. You never had big expectations, but today you feel something you didn't expect. You feel a drawing. You feel your, your value as the Father speaks to you through the Holy Spirit. Do you know that when we discover the value of this pearl, of this great salvation, of the kingdom of heaven, of the presence of God, when we discover this treasure, this relationship with Christ, the amazing thing about Jesus is that he then communicates our value to him. He communicates to us how valuable we are to him. We not only receive immeasurable value, we, re- we realize that we are invaluable to him as well. So much so that he was willing to sacrifice his life for us. He paid the greatest price because of how much he values you. Everything that happened from the moment that we fell in the Garden of Eden, and I say we because we're part of it, until he was hung on that cross, was pointing back to fixing the relationship that was broken because he values and he loves you so much. Understand today that Jesus wants a relationship with you. And that relationship, the greatest pearl, the greatest treasure, the gift, is something that's here available for us today. We may not find that there are many times in this life where the cost, the value ratio match, matches up. And we've all been there. We've all felt like we've been ripped off on times. 
We've all felt like we've got the best deal imaginable. But this is a can't miss. Yeah, I can't stand here and tell you that the cost of serving Jesus is not great. In my lifetime, I've lost friends. I've, often, I've had to move on times w- with my call. <laughs> I've had situations in my life where I've had to say no to things and not be a part of other things and separate myself from certain situations. I've had people look at me differently, treat me differently. I've gone to social situations and and because I don't do this or I won't do that, all of a sudden I feel like I make everybody uncomfortable and sometimes I just feel like I just want to leave. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. But there's a cost. There's a cost. And the question we need to ask is, what is my relationship with Christ worth to me? Have I been willing to give up everything I have, everything I am? And does my life and sacrifice to play, display my value for this relationship with Jesus? Yes, the cost is great. It will cost us everything, but eternity with Christ, eternity in the presence of God is worth it. It's worth it. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence. Lord, I pray that it be something that we never underestimate. Lord, in our human nature, we go around and I admit there's times where we don't feel your presence, we don't sense your presence, but that doesn't mean you're not there. And Lord, there's times that we we focus on things like heaven, we focus on things like hell, and we think about the good things and and that we want to get there and get the good things, or we want to go there because we want to avoid, avoid all the bad things of hell, Lord Jesus. But the only thing that matters, Lord, about heaven and hell is that you're in one of those places and you're not in the other. Father, when I think about being somewhere where you're not, Lord, I think about an existence where there's no goodness, there's no grace, there's no mercy, there's nothing that we enjoy, nothing that was created. Lord, I value the kingdom of heaven today because I value your presence. I value this relationship I have with you because I value your presence. Lord, I pray today that we would be challenged to let that value be visible to people. That people would see what our pearl of greatest value is. Lord, that they would see the treasure that we would sell everything to obtain that it would be attractive to them and that they would want it themselves. Father, we love you today. We bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. I just want to invite you just to keep uh, our government in your prayers. They have tough decisions to make. Keep our pastoral staff in your prayers. Keep this church and your family in your prayers. Um, You know, pray for our health. Pray for our safety. And uh, just continue to trust God. Amen. Let me just close in prayer. Father, we just love you. We honor you. I pray that you would just be blessed, Lord, by how we have given in worship today, O oh God, and how we've sang and how we've heard and apply your word to our life, O oh God. We pray you would just bless us now today that you would go with us, O oh God. Keep this family safe, Lord Jesus. Go with the power of the Holy Spirit on our lives, Lord Jesus. Help us to reflect the infinite value of knowing you, Lord, in our lives. We just love you. We care for you. We we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this morning.